Hello everyone. How are you? Happy Wednesday. I am on my regular spot to answer some of your questions and to take questions. I love your questions. They're great questions. And if you have a question, it is highly likely that many, many other people will want to know the answer to your question. So please feel free to put in the chat any questions. Hi guys, coming on and uh, we will kick it off. I actually was going to talk about how your soulmate doesn't come through FOMO. A lot of people have FOMO, fear of missing out. And I was saying last night when I was speaking at a, at a class that we should practice JOMO, right? JOMO is the joy of missing out, right? Not, rather than being so driven and controlled by whatever's going on around us externally that we should really start to learn how to define ourselves internally. And uh, when we do that, we are free. We are truly free as we are actually coming up to Passover in a month. Um, the whole theme of that is freedom. How do I break free of my inner limitations? And so one of the ways that we stay trapped and we stay uh, controlled really is by being governed by this fear of missing out. And particularly with marriage, because as people start getting engaged around you, it uh, becomes very painful, obviously, because it's reflecting back your pain of being single, understandably. However, I see a lot of people put in the effort uh, to, let's say, I want to go out just in case there's a good guy there or just in case. Now, on one level, that's really practical and it makes sense to do that. And I often encourage that. However, it's more about where are you coming from emotionally? And we want to look behind the action to where you're being motivated from. Are you being motivated from the fact that, yes, I have to put in some effort, I have to get out there, that's a good thing. But if it's being motivated by this sort of fear that's driving you, then the fear is coming from a lack and an incompleteness. And that incompleteness and lack will keep playing out subconsciously. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because when you are lacking and you are in a way desperate, it creates a desperation, right? This fear of missing out. It's a desperation. It's, it's basically screaming that I'm not really secure in myself. And because I'm not secure in myself, I need to do something out there. I need validation. I need approval. I need a marriage. I need a job. I need whatever it is to feel okay, right? So, so we don't want that because really good, great relationships don't come from that place. That ends up turning into codependence. When I need something else outside of me to make me feel whole and complete, as in I don't really feel worthy and okay on my own, that turns into codependency and it implodes. It doesn't last, right? Doesn't last. That's true. Someone is saying marriage is nothing special if you're with the wrong person that drains you, but you have a body next to you. Yes, 100%. That's very... Actually, you know what? I think that's even more painful than being single. I think it's very painful. And I remember for many, many years when I was single, uh, thinking it's better to be single than be in a marriage that I'm really miserable in because then you're trapped, right? And I know there's a lot of difficult marriages out there. Um, and I remember thinking that would be really, really hard. So I 100% agree with you. And, you know, then you have to look at, well, what can I do to make that marriage better? How can I respond in a way that might make that marriage better? What, what can I do to keep improving it? Because what some people don't realize is that uh, number one, I have to work on myself to feel worthy no matter what, right? So on one hand, as soon as you don't need something, it comes to you. You've heard that principle before spiritually. So when you chase after something, it also repels away from you, right? It really does. There's actual sources in, uh, in, in the Torah about this, that in Gomorrah, uh, Gomorrah and Brachas, I think, that if you chase after an undeserving moment, meaning it's not ready, the time's not right, it will literally like evade you, so to speak. Um, it's an unbelievable idea, but it also makes sense because if you know if you have a friend who's really needy and kind of like wants more from you than you can give or that you're really willing to give or that you want to give, you just kind of back away and, and create distance. So there's a, there's, a, there's a principle there that goes across the board spiritually, but also emotionally, psychologically. And we want to be able to come back to ourselves and feel worthy no matter what. And from that place, we want to have a relationship, right? Which is a relationship of building something bigger than me with someone else. I want to build something bigger than me. I want to be a giver. I'm not going into a marriage or a relationship by saying, I want to take. I want to take. What can they give me? How will I be happy if I'm with them? It's all a focus on me, 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 me. And actually, true healthy relationship and marriage is about being a giver and about developing ourselves through the motion of giving. 
And this is a problem because if that's healthy marriage, right, is learning how to be a giver and learning how to self-sacrifice, learning how to let go of what you want. I once went to a, to, a, to a rabbi in Israel and said, how do I prepare for marriage thinking he's going to give me some deep, dark, you know, deep light, I should say, not dark, deep, light, Kabbalistic secret. And he just goes, practice letting go of what you want. I said, what? He said, practice letting go of what you want. I said, what do you mean? And he said, marriage is a continuous process of, I want this, and maybe it doesn't fit into the picture with me and my, my spouse or my family. I can just let it go. Like I can learn to surrender it. It doesn't mean you don't ever get what you want, but it just means it's not about me anymore. When you get married, you become bigger than just little you with the little I, right? You become a bigger I, a bigger we. And you want to be able to do whatever the broader unit of you guys as a couple uh, need. And then that creates a deeper happiness. So you end up being happier that way. But it's not about little old me and my ego and what do I always get? Because that's very small. It's very narrow. It doesn't create happiness. So it's really a practice of expanding yourself. That's what healthy marriage is. Now, if you're not whole enough, no one's fully whole and no one's fully perfect ever before marriage. Or as long as you're alive, you're not perfect. You're developing yourself and you're growing. But if I don't feel whole enough to get married and I'm looking for marriage to make me feel better, to make me feel worthy, to make me feel finally like I'm like everyone else. Finally, now I get to feel normal. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's going to lead, lead to dysfunction and toxicity. And so we really want to check our attitude. We want to check our perspective and our mindset before. Like, what am I really expecting of marriage? What am I wanting from marriage? Am I really going in as a giver or am I secretly going in as a taker? And like, I want them to make me feel good. And I think this is so important not to judge yourself for it, but to notice where is that in me and what, what do I need to develop so that I feel whole, that I don't need someone else to make me feel good. So we talked a lot last night at this, at this event that I was speaking at on external validation and how the more you seek external validation, even in a spouse, the more it chips away at your self-esteem and self-worth because no one else can really give you that validation. And so then you never fully feel validated. And we play this out all the time on social media because we go onto social media and we look at how many people gave me the validation of you know my likes and my posts and whatever. I'm talking to myself right now as well. And when we do that, we give our power away to other people to define us and to make us feel good or not or the other way. And we, d we really mustn't do that because what happens is, is we end up treating ourselves shallowly. We treat ourselves as objects when we do this. We objectify ourselves that it's just like my worth is based on other people's likes or validation. And it's very dangerous because that plays out in the dating scene enormously. When I objectify myself or make or treat myself superficially, I'm going to treat others superficially and I'm going to assess and judge when I'm dating about uh, on that superficial level. And it becomes superficial in the sense that I'll give you an example. Let's say you see a beautiful sunset. And in that moment, there's this literally breathtaking sunset. And instead of taking a moment to just pause and take it in, like let it actually affect you and make contact with the depth of your being where you actually can experience and enjoy life, even just for a moment or two. What do we do? We pull out the phone to take a photo so we can post it on social media. And in that moment, we've skimmed the surface of the experience and we've already grabbed it to throw it back out again. So it's like skimming an experience, taking it and throwing it back out so that I get the, the feedback and the validation that then I let myself feel good. And that's very dangerous because it's, it's a loop of superficiality I don't ever stop and let things in. I don't let it make full contact with my being. And we are deep spiritual connectors. That's who, that's what we are as human beings, right? We're built to connect and we're built to have uh, this experience that's so rich, deep, full and blessed. And if we're running around for FOMO and we're running around, you know, getting validation externally, we, we lose touch with the capacity to have that deeper connected experience with ourselves firstly and then with another and so then the relationship can also become quite objectified and superficial so we want to make sure there's nothing obviously wrong with social media we're all on it now 
<laughs> but um, we want to make sure to make sure that we have those moments where we're not just skimming the surface, where we're not just treating ourselves like a superficial being and we are letting ourselves make contact. And the best way to do that is to experience silence. Sil nowadays, we're never silent, right? We, we're never without some sort of distraction, music, podcasts, as something going on, distraction, feeding us all the time that we're never left to just sit with ourselves. Not even meditation, but just quiet moment of like going for a walk in nature, swimming, even swimming they have underwater headphones and the pools pipe music. Everything is always constantly stimulation rather than if we just let ourselves, you know, sit with ourselves and just notice what's happening inside. So A, you get to know yourself a lot better and B, you become able to accept reality as it is because the practice of acceptance, what is happening when I'm quiet with myself and whatever's happening, it's okay. I'm quiet. I'm just with myself, whatever's happening. Okay. Right now I'm very distracted. That's okay too. Right. Right now I'm feeling whatever tension inside myself. That's okay. The more you can bring a sense of acceptance to whatever's happening inside of you, the more you'll actually be free, the more you'll actually relax and all those things start to calm down and dissolve. And what we tend to do is instead is the opposite, fill it with all this distraction, fill it with stimulus or stimuli and, um, and it, just, it just creates more of it, right? Because what we resist persists. What we resist persists. So in order to change that, we need to actually stop and accept. And when we stop and accept by just creating a moment, a pause, it has time to just move through us, right? But we don't want it. We can't rush it out. If we want, if we rush and push and try and change things inside of us, and I, it's really a disguised lack of acceptance, right? It's a disguised fixing. That's really a type of self rejection. And the thing that keeps us stuck across all things that is judgment and blame and fixing, meaning I'm rejecting what's actually going on. And the irony is that the more you accept what's actually happening, like right now, this is where I'm at and this is what's going on and that's okay. It doesn't mean you don't want to improve. It's very important to know that that does not mean you don't want to grow and improve. Acceptance does not nullify that. But it does mean to stop to start with, this is where I'm at right now. I'm going to accept this is where I'm at and that's okay. And now what's the next step? And people skip that. They skip the acceptance. They just go to just keep changing myself constantly, constantly changing myself, judging myself, fixing myself. And that is actually a profound, deep self-rejection, which really chips away at your, your sense of self, your sense of self and self-worth. And then that plays out in all your dating. Deep down, you don't feel really okay. I'm always changing myself. I'm always got to grow. Whatever I'm experiencing, it's not okay. It's stupid. It's this, it's that. It comes from here. I've got to change it. It's not good enough. You could spend your whole life just beating yourself up. That's what we do. We just beat ourselves up all the time. If I looked into your brain for a week, it would be terrible. I'm sure what I see, right? The, how, the way you speak to yourself. And so we want to be able to change how we talk to ourselves and we have to look at which voice do I listen to? Which voice do I give power to? We have different voices in our head, right? Like different thought processes. Which voice do I listen to? Have you ever thought about that? Which voice? How do I know which voice to give power to, to give like airtime to? Because we have all sorts of crazy thoughts that pop up in our head and we can choose. How do I respond to that? It says that you're not responsible. Uh, for the first thought that pops up, but you are responsible for the second. So the first thought that pops up could be something outrageous or silly or bad or negative or whatever, but it's how do I respond to that? How do I respond to that first thought? Do I indulge it? Do I follow it? Do I listen to it? Do I believe it? We often respond to our thoughts in our head as if it's absolute reality. Reality, and it's not. It's just literally a wafting thought through our head. And so uh, one of the best ways to discern what voice to listen to. I'm totally going on my rant tonight. I, this was not even planned. I'm just literally talking. It's hilarious. It's just coming. You're like pulling it out of me. Whoever comes on is like a dynamic that pulls things out of you. It's funny because I wasn't planning to talk about this at all. But basically, I hope this is helpful. Please let me know if it's not. I can do, do it down like boo or, you know, yay. Um, please feel free to put in any questions or comments. Uh, which voice do I listen to? Which voice do I listen to in my head? So there's one question you can ask yourself. This will change your life. If you ask yourself this question, it will tell you immediately what to listen to. And that voice is, if I, if I follow this voice in my head, whatever, whatever it's saying, where will I end up? If I follow this voice in my head, where will I end up? Will I end up feeling like a piece of dirt and wanting to give up and saying it's, I'm just pathetic? Or will I end up feeling like, wow, yeah, I've got to do something about that. I'm motivated. I want to improve myself. I want to become a better version of who I am. And usually when we have these voices, it's that I'm going to end up feeling like a piece of dirt. 
I feel like this big, right? I'm beating myself up. I'm judging myself. I'm treat, treating. And even the, the tricky thing is that it often uses aspects of truth. So there's aspects that are true, but I'm using it to whip myself rather than to help myself improve. So just ask yourself, would I speak to my best friend this way? If I really saw a flaw in my best friend, how would I speak to my best friend if I really wanted them to help to grow and change this thing? I would just say, you idiot. No, that's not going to get any reaction. So the, with the, the voices we want to listen to in our, that come from our higher self, our soul, are compassionate and supportive, even when they're bringing up the truth. And if your voice is not kind and it's not compassionate, you absolutely should not listen to it. Even if it's got elements of truth in it, don't listen to it. Here, here's the trick. The trick is, and this goes for also negative negativity about dating, like with dating, we jump into the worst case scenario in the future, which isn't, hasn't even happened and it's not even real yet. But we want to be able to bring ourselves back into the present and you can't resist the voice. You can't try and like get rid of the voice. That's the, that's the, da- that's the problem that a lot of people fall into or, the, or the, the trap is they try to get rid of that voice, the negative voice. You can't get rid of it. The more you resist it, the more it persists, right? What you resist persists. So in order to deal with that voice, what you need to do is recognize what it is. Okay, I'm going to end up feeling like a piece of dirt. If I follow that voice, I'm not, I don't want to follow that voice. And you just redirect your attention. So you don't try and stop the voice, but you redirect it to something else. Well, what do I want? Right? What do I want in this moment? We're so focused on what we don't want that we never focus on what we do want. Have you ever noticed that? We have such a power of intention and imagination that we keep focusing on what we don't want and what the worst case scenario. And like, I'm so scared that's going to happen. He's going to reject me. I'm going to do something wrong. I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to whatever. Like we go into, yes, I'm Australian. Um, we go into the next, the good pick. Usually Americans can't pick that. I don't know if you're American, but anyway, um, usually we can't pick, um, you know, we can't, we, we don't notice when we're, uh, resisting, but we can't resist it. And we always go into this worst case scenario into the future rather than stay with the best case scenario, right? And it's equal chances. Why on earth am I going to the negative all the time? Cause I'm so scared of it. So then I keep fueling the fear. So we want to do is we want to redirect. We want to say, what do I want? What do I want? Let me align with that. What would it feel like if this went well? Right. This sports psychologists do this all the time with, with athletes, you know, they get them to visualize how the race or how what the, usually the race goes or the event in the best possible way, because then their mind is rehearsing it and then they're aligning with it on a resonance level as well. And so we want to do the same. We want to treat ourselves in the same way with that level of mastery. We want to be able to choose which voice to listen to. And if it's the voice we don't want to listen to, we just want to give it no power. So one of the best uh, metaphors I've heard is a barking chihuahua. Imagine it's like a, the negative voice. It's like a yapping chihuahua and it's tied to a tree and you just walk on past it. So it's just, it's in the background. It's just in the background. I'm not trying to stop a yapping chihuahua. It's just an annoying yapping chihuahua, right? It's in the background. And I walk on past, right? I just walk on past. I'm focused on other things. It's, it's a background noise, not a, not a front, not a, not a foreground noise. And so this is all so important for dating because our mindset is everything. People don't realize. People give you all the advice, self-help books, coaches, great advice. It's all good advice, right? However, if you don't know how you're showing up and what the mindset is that you're showing up with, you'll totally blow the date. It'll ruin the date right? However, you won't know why. And you'll say, I did all the right things and I wore the right clothes and I said the right, like you'll, you'll go through the motions and no one will be able to help you, but you have to look inside yourself and see what's actually going on here for you to feel um, like you really have some choice around this. So having said that, I have some questions that you guys put, uh, put in the, the stories today, uh, this week. Um, Yeah, this is interesting. Why don't guys fly out for dates? Why do the girls have to do it? So I agree with you. I think a guy in general should try to be chivalrous and come to the woman first. However, sometimes life just doesn't work that way. And sometimes it's just like either you don't, you're not going to meet or if the woman's more flexible, she can fly to him or go to him. It's not advisable because... It just doesn't feel it just doesn't feel good for the woman to put herself so far out there, right? If it's so far out there and make herself so vulnerable when the man's sort of sitting back and he's comfortable. It's nicer for the man generally again, I'm generalizing, there's always exceptions, but it's nicer for the man to go to the woman 
and and put that effort in initially, right? After they've dated a couple of times, I think there's nothing wrong with that. My husband actually um, lived in LA and I lived in New York and I um, was going to fly out to LA first because he had two kids who here and he said he can't leave the kids. And I was willing to do it because my job was flexible. But deep down, I was really disappointed because I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to feel special and him to come to me, but I understood the circumstance. And for some miraculous reason, we don't even know why to this day, it was like the weirdest thing. He said he's never offered to do this ever because the kids were too difficult and whatever to leave. Um, he called me up and said, you know, I could come to New York. I went, really? That'd be great. And he literally got on a plane. He arranged kids and his mom came or whatever. And he flew to New York and it really, it just made me feel good. It made me feel good. And so but then after, we, after that, those, I think, three dates we had, I said, I, would not, I want to get to know you more also. And um, I, I'll come to LA next. So I went to LA next. So I think, I think it is, um, it's not about that girls have to do it, as, as this person's saying, but sometimes, sometimes it's necessary and it's better to do that not, than not meet at all, right? But ideally, I agree with you. The guys should do it. Um, okay. Some of these I don't understand, so I'm not even going to, someone says about, talked about the frustration of BT guys, Bali Chiva guys who want to marry FFB girls despite their own history. Yeah, I hear it's tricky. You have different backgrounds, different life stages, different experiences. And sometimes, um, sometimes that's threatening to people right? Threatening to people if you've had a lot of experience in your background and someone else hasn't and there's an inequality there that can be, um, you have to make sure that your date or whoever you're dating, your girlfriend and then your wife feels very secure, very secure about themselves with you. If that's the case, that would, that would be my advice there. And I know plenty of couples where the, the husband was a Balchuva and the wife is an FFB and they work actually very well together, that combination, because the woman looks up to often the Balchuva's worldliness and experience and uh, the, Balch the, the husband really values the woman's ability to have a sense of what a Jewish home is like internalized inside of her and she's very comfortable with it. And so that works really well. What doesn't work is the other way, ironically, that often a Balchuva woman uh, doesn't marry an FFB guy so well, so easily, right? Because you don't want the woman to have all this worldly experience and the man feels kind of somehow smaller, more threatened by that. It just for some reason doesn't work that dynamic. So that's, and I checked that with a lot of different uh, people and they all agree. Interestingly, that's what they've seen over the years. So, okay. Um, uh, How can I help my older daughter with the dating process? How can I help my older daughter with the, with the dating process? This is obviously from a mother. And I would say you have to demonstrate trust and let go. And the more I can't tell you how many singles have talked to me about their own angst at the parents pressure, at the parents suffering, at the parents being in pain. And that just adds, it literally compounds the, to, the, to the singles pain. Right, so, so the best thing you can do as a parent is take the pressure off, take your expectations off, even though of course you have them and it's understandable, but don't like guilt trip, don't pressure, uh, and don't, don't spray your anxiety on a single, which I know is hard, but it's your job as a parent to pull back and to trust God also that God has a plan for your kid and uh, your job is to trust also, right? It's often the parents will have to trust as well. And so it's, it's a combination of, of different practices. The, 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 the daughter or the son actually practicing trust in their own dating, but also the parent practicing trust. They don't have to like guilt trip and pressure and worry and get anxious and uh, also not jump into the worst case scenario in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one for everyone, but you have, to, uh, you have to work at it. You have to really try to do that. And, and let her feel secure in her decision making. Um, one of the biggest tragedies that I see is that singles, they do need to learn how to trust themselves more. Again, one of the biggest goals I have with all my clients coming through my course is that they don't trust themselves, right? So self-trust is huge because if you can't trust your decision making, how on earth can you pick a, a spouse for life? It's the scariest possible idea to do that if you don't trust yourself. So on one hand, you have to learn how to trust yourself. But on the other hand, 
to tell a single that they don't know what they're talking about and they and like to push them into things when they don't feel right doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what, you want them to get married now not feeling like it's okay and just hope for the best? I cannot tell you how many ruined marriages that's created. Why? Because we aren't, we aren't inside that relationship. No one else can tell you who to marry or who not to marry. It has to be your decision. And if you don't know how to make that decision, then you need to learn how to make that decision. You need to learn not just what factors are important, but how, how do I feel? Right? It's a subjective, this is a subjective experience. It's a, it's a subjective decision. No one else can make it. It's, it's got to be how you feel as well. And if you're not in touch with your feelings or if your feelings are driven by other fears and wounds from the past or baggage or exes or God knows what, then you must clear that. You must work with that because you're not going to feel like a clear, you know, uh, resonance inside of you. I would say the soulmate feels like home, not Hollywood, but you can't feel that unless you're at home in yourself. So you have to be able to be at home in yourself as well. And that means being comfortable with feelings and working through things and processing. And, you know, you're meant to like your spouse. Do you know that? You're meant to actually enjoy him, her. So do you have fun together? Do you feel comfortable? Can you be your full self around them? These are feeling-based things and they have they, they really count. Yes, the, the mind has to lead, has to be aligned with values and direction and make sense and be practical, but it has to then connect with the heart. And with the gut, the gut security, stability, the heart is love and connection. And I have to get feedback from my gut and from my heart leading with the head. So that's an important thing. Okay. How do you expand your network, especially when you're in a rural or small Jewish community? It has to be online. It has to be online. Or you have to literally take off and go somewhere for a month or two. Like and sort of go to date for a couple months. That's what I did actually. I went to, that's what, one of the things that brought me to America was really coming here to date. So I don't think there's any other way around it. Oh, there's a new um, website called Gumzuli, gumzuli.com. Check it out. Gumzuli, it's, it's literally in beta mode and it, I think it's driven by AI and it's really hopefully better uh, experience. And the first step is that if you both match, um, it's an automatic 15 minute Zoom call timed by the website. So then after 15 minutes, you're out of there. Like you don't have to do any painful long Zoom calls and whatever. Like, how do I get off? Like, it's just like 15 minutes. It's an awesome idea. And then if you like each other and want to do another call, it's like a max 45 minute call, like Zoom call or whatever, or, or face to face. I thought that was really interesting. Anyway, have a look on there. I think there's some good people on there. Gamzu Lee, right? Gamzu Lee. Um, someone said, I haven't dated in a very long time. A guy's interested. I'm not so thrilled. Should I try? Yes, you should try. <laughs> I don't know why you haven't dated in a very long time, but if a guy is interested, go out. Unless you're repulsed. If you're repulsed, you can call it off. If you're just not so thrilled and it's like, eh, whatever, go out. Because you don't know where an emotional connection leads. Emotional connections lead to chemistry. I have said this before. I will say it again. Emotional connections lead to chemistry, but it's a slow burn. It's not this Hollywood chills attraction like, weak at the knees, you know, electricity thing. That's, that's a hot, that's a movie. That, that's not real. What, what you want to do is you want to look for, does it slowly build this sort of warmth and this draw? And I want to see him again. Yeah. I want to see him again. I want to speak to him again. I'm, I want to share my day with him. Eventually, obviously, if you don't know him at first, it takes a while to build that up, but it's a slow burn, slow burn and warm. How to stay positive and strong after a breakup for two months for two months dating and now I'm back at square one again and I want to try again. Okay, so this is my whole how to get over the X thing and I have a PDF if anyone wants it. Um, you have to let go of that X. You have to learn about what went wrong with that X and what you learnt from that X as in all, even the negative things like I'll never do that again, you know, that kind of thing or boundary setting or what, what, what was this relationship in your life to teach you? And when you truly can own the lessons that it taught you, then you can let something go. You can let your ex go, right? But sometimes you, relationships are always learning experiences. They're mirrors. So we, we're meant to learn from them. And so you really, in order to be able to move on and let go, you have to take those lessons out of there and to be able to let it go and move on. And so part of that is also really acknowledging what was wrong with the relationship because sometimes we fantasize and we keep that alive, that ex. And we want to be able to acknowledge that there was a lot of things wrong with it. And this is why it didn't work out. 
be really honest with yourself. Then talk about the lessons, like journal the lessons that you got out of it. And I recommend definitely blocking on social media and blocking phone numbers, just like you're, you're, you need emotional and psychological distance. Uh, and then writing a goodbye letter. And people don't, haven't done this, and when they do it, they feel very emotional and it really helps them. So I want you to write a goodbye letter to that ex and I want you to write down all the things that you miss about that ex, all the little things, like all the, all the little details that you keep replaying in your head. I want you to say goodbye to every single one in as much detail as possible. And I want you to let yourself cry and let yourself grieve. And then after you finish that and you want to address it to the ex, right? And after you finish that and finally say your final goodbye, I want you to burn it and give it back to God. Just surrender it back up. It's back to you, Hashem. Yeah. So, um, and when you do that, people feel like a weight lift. It's, it's really quite amazing when I, when you just burn it and like release it. And then that hopefully will allow some space for you to be free, for you to be able to be available to meet the right one. So, um, because we, we really want it, we really don't want to stay entangled psychologically and spiritually and emotionally with an ex, right? We want to be able to clear up, uh, clear, clear ourselves up to be available for that. So Okay, um, last question. Anyone got questions? Feel free, feel free to chat them in. I hope this is resonating. Uh, okay. Let's see. Hmm, nothing really here that I particularly think is good. Um, okay, last night we talked about self-worth, self-love and uh at this event i was at and so we were talking about the fact that self uh self-worth is obviously a real thing and uh it's it, people most of people believe that intrinsically we're worthy like philosophically intrinsically we're worthy however when you look at society society says that no actually the more beautiful the more power the more status the more fame the more intelligence the more money you have the more valuable you are that's the message we get and yet we know that intrinsically everyone's worthy. So where does that come from? Where is that worth from? Is worth based on your achievements? Is it based on any of those other elements I mentioned? And the answer is really we know that we're flawed and we know that we're quite inferior as, as puny human beings. Like what do we know? We don't really know how to do much and we really don't know. We're not in control of much in the world, right? I can't even tell you how I raise my hand and lower my hand. I just think to do it and it just does it, but I don't know how I do it. Like we just don't know much, right? If you're really honest with yourself, you don't, it's not a lot we know how to do. Um, and so one of my favorite rabbis said, there's no such thing as an inferiority complex. You are inferior, <laughs> right? Meaning, so what, what, where, where do we get that self-worth from? And that self-worth really comes from the fact that we have a higher self and that higher self is connected. The soul is connected to a higher power and we have that potential. We have that potential to be godly, I guess, is the word, right word. And that gives us our worth, that we're already worthy. You already are worthy. There's nothing you have to do to earn your worth. You already are worthy. And we, when you can tap in, when you can learn to tap in to that higher self in you, you will feel that worth. When you learned how to get out of your way and actually tap into that higher self, you will feel your worth and then you want to go out on a date from that place, right? And that's something that's easily taught. You can experience that. Um, it's something I teach in my course if anyone's interested. And um, it's, it's, it's something that's really important to learn how, to, um, how to, to just relate to yourself differently, right? Relate to yourself differently from this place of dignity, from this place of honor, um, in a, not an arrogant way, but in the sense that I'm, you know, I'm made with a certain potential. I'm made with, um, with this soul, with this, with this godliness. And when you date from that place, it comes across. People feel it. People feel your self-respect. People feel that and they treat you with respect because how we treat ourselves is what we attract in our life. The Talmud says we don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we are. So we have a lens and we look out of that lens and that lens is who I am. And uh, I attract people also that resonate with how I treat myself. So, um, so we really, yeah, we really, we really have to draw this self-worth from this higher place in ourselves and we have to let ourselves feel it. Imagine, uh, imagine how unconditionally loved we are by this higher power, right? And that we're created on purpose and here for a reason. 
And when you believe that, then it really it really taps into that essential goodness and essential self-worth that we're here for a reason. And you're, you are here personally for a reason. You're here personally for a reason and you're here to also contribute and do something with your tough gear, the purpose, right? Your purpose in life. And when you believe that and you don't believe you're just some redundant background figure uh, in the world that no one really, you're not really important. A lot of people feel redundant in life. Uh, and then that's just a reflection of their self-worth or self-esteem. When you really think it through and think I'm actually here for a reason and I've got to work that out. Part of the jigsaw puzzle of life is working out what I'm here to do, what I'm here to contribute, what I'm here to correct. And when you start to look at it through that lens, you see yourself differently and you treat yourself differently and you have a different tikkun, right? A tikkun is the soul, soul correction. Um, you, you take that growth path as the priority rather than, oh, it's just inconvenience. I've got to just like get rid of these problems in my life and then have a happy life. That's not what God, the goal of life is not just to bounce around and be happy, even though we're meant to enjoy the world and enjoy life. It's to become the best version of yourself and enjoy it along the way. And so we get all sorts of experiences and circumstances and tests to do that. And being single is one of them. Being single is one of those tests and those pathways to develop your greatness. And when you can see singlehood or singledom, I don't know which is, singledom I don't know. when you can see singledom as uh, as a pathway for that for you to wrestle with this experience of being single as a pathway that's developing your greatness by not getting what you want when you want it by not having someone to soothe you because you have to find it just deep within yourself and you give up and then you come back and then you give up again and then you come back and you yell at God and then you feel despair and then you come back. That's building you. All of it. All of it is building you. And you don't realize it when you're in it. Believe me, for years I, I just hated it and didn't realize. And now looking back, I see what I see. I see what it did. I see some of what it did, right? It, it's building you and it's designed on purpose. It's not a punishment. There's nothing wrong with you. It doesn't mean you don't need to improve things. You need to work on yourself. But it's, it's a different way of looking at it. And I think it's really important. As singles to um, to look at singlehood that way so um, if anyone has any questions oh here's someone Rachel said I'm real ready to date the only thing is I'm being pushed since I'm 20 that's very young which makes me run away from dating even if I feel ready so it's interesting you're being pushed 20 because that is very young um, and you're just reacting to being pushed. No one likes being pushed, right? If someone says, you've got to take out the trash, what do you want to do? Not take out the trash. That's, you know, that's, that's just human nature. And again, what I would encourage you to do, Rachel, is to separate away from whoever's pushing you, even if it's parents, and dig deep inside yourself and say, what do I want? What do I need? And try and define yourself from internally, from what you want and what you need, right? Because in order to get married, there's a very clear line, right, in the Torah, which is that we have to be able to leave our parents' house in order to cleave as one flesh, which is marriage, right? Because marriage is about oneness and, and unity and connecting like on the most intimate level on all levels. That's really the Jewish view of marriage is that complete oneness on all levels. And if I'm still governed by my parents, I'm still in their house. If they're still able to define and control me, doesn't mean you don't take their opinion and you don't take their input seriously for sure but if i can't define myself and everything i'm doing is in reaction to them either it's complying with what they want or it's rebelling against what they want i don't push me or i won't date right i'm still being owned and defined by them and what i want to do when i get married or when i'm dating and getting ready to get married is i want to be able to individuate act self-actualize away from the family dynamic right it doesn't mean physically distance it means I'm my own person. I can make my own decisions. Some of those will align and be agreeable to my parents and some of those won't. And it has nothing to do with the fact that you love them deeply. You do and you should respect them deeply, but you're your own person and you will do lots of things that your parents might not agree with, right? With, with parenting, with, with buying a house, with, with all sorts of things and maybe even a marriage partner, although that's hard or you want your parents to agree, hopefully. But you need to be able to speak openly to them and say, listen, I feel ready, but being, pu being pushing... Pushing me is turning me off and making me not want to date. So please stop pushing me. You have to be able to set a boundary with your parents, which is really hard. It's the hardest people to set a boundary with or ask for respect or space. But we, we want to be able to um, set the boundary. So we have to be able to leave our parents' house in order to get married. And there's many people that don't do that. And it creates a little bit of havoc 
because you're kind of like living in two houses, right? You're governed by two different domains, right? Parents' house and my new domain with my husband or wife. And so you want to be able to um, leave that and your primary stake in the ground, so to speak, is with your spouse. That's, that's, where, that's where it is. Once you leave, once you get married, you're starting a new creature, like a new unit that's the, the we or the us. And uh, that's really, really important to, that's got to be a priority. And then when you have kids, even more so. So it's a hard transition. It's hard for your parents. It's hard for you. But that's the transition that needs to start happening. And the first step is choosing to do something because you feel ready. And if you feel ready to date, it doesn't really matter if your parents are pushing you or not. I don't know why they're pushing you if you feel ready to date, because that means everyone's on the same page. So I'm a little bit confused about that. But um, you got to listen to yourself, listen to your voice, listen to your higher voice. And, um, and that way you will be able to trust yourself, right? When we listen to our highest voice, we, we, we have to trust, we, we trust ourselves. So, um, please feel free to put any, any other questions in. I'm out of questions here. I will sign off and, um, looking forward. You can always, uh, DM me any questions as well and, uh, have a great night. Bye guys.